Hi. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. So um, I work, or I have worked for quite some time on uh, understanding the transition to turbulence and shear flows. I'm still learning about directed percolation, so please be kind if I say something that's come correct me privately. Let's put it that way. All right. So, so this is this is uh, arguably one of the oldest problems in in fluid dynamics. Well, one has wall bounded shear flows. Uh, classically, the the oldest problem is flow through a pipe, which Osborne and Reynolds uh, began the investigation of over 125 years ago. So, one has these these shear flows in which we know simple laminar solutions, you know, plain channel, pipe flow, shear flow between parallel plates. We know what happens at low Reynolds number. and You increase the Reynolds number, the, the driving of the system, and the flow becomes turbulent. And the question is, how does that happen? What route does it take from laminar to turbulent flow? That's the, the it's, a, it's a simple question to state. It's an incredibly hard uh, question to answer. So there are two things I need for you to understand about subcritical shear, uh, uh, about these wall bounded shear flows. The first of which is that they're subcritical, meaning that if you look at this diagram here, this is Reynolds number and this is amplitude, just some, it's just a sketch to give you ideas, is that this laminar branch, this lam these laminar solutions, which we know analytically, um, are simply uh, remain stable well beyond the, the occurrence of turbulence. They, in fact, may be, re remain linearly stable to infinitely high Reynolds numbers, okay? So turbulence first appears even though laminar flow has not yet become unstable. So it's subcritical, it's a hard transition. And uh, it's so, imp it's so in in important to this talk, I'm going to give you this little illustration. This is a Coke can under pressure. It's linearly stable. There's all kinds of fluctuations going around uh, in the environment here, and it will remain in this state indefinitely. This is laminar flow, okay? This is laminar flow. It's, 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 but you introduce a finite perturbation and you make this transition, a discontinuous transition to a different state, okay? So this is the, the picture of inverse height as a function of pressure. That's your laminar flow, this, this Coke can, and this is your turbulence. And I really want you to appreciate that that's important. These are very, very far apart. The turbulence in this and the laminar flow are very, very far apart in any normal measure that you would make, okay? And there's a threshold you have to cross. The second thing you need to know uh, dates back to original observations by Osborne Reynolds in 1883. These are, in this field, classical uh, images from this. So this is a function of increasing flow speed or Reynolds number. And at low uh, flow rates, as we know, there's laminar flow. And this is a dye visualization. So the flow is laminar. The, the, the dye goes straight through the pipe. At high Reynolds numbers, the flow is turbulent. And again, even though laminar flow hasn't become unstable, almost any little fluctuation will give you turbulence, and that turbulence will fill the pipe. So for, Above, let's say, Reynolds number 5,000, just to give you some order of magnitude, you will always get this, and you just have lots of turbulence, okay? When you first see turbulence, it occurs intermittently, okay? It occurs in this state. And I'll just tell you now, this thought was thought to be fluctuations in the experiment and so forth. We know that that is not the case. This is the fundamental dynamical state that transitional turbulence takes. All right, and again, I want you to remember that this, this is just a sketch again, that this is like the uncrushed cocaine, that's a crushed cocaine, uncrushed, crushed. These are very distinct states, okay? So you have this alternation, complex spatial temporal alternation between these distinct states. All right, and here's some visualizations of this intermittent turbulence in a variety of situations. I want you to just, all right, first of all, I want you to focus on this case here, plain coet flow. It's flow between uh, two plates. There's a gap, the fluid between the gap, and you're looking at it from this direction, okay? And you can kind of see there's turbulence, not turbulence, turbulence, not turbulence. I'll play a little movie just to convince you. These are dynamical, all right? So there's turbulence going on here, and it's organized into this way, all right? And if you look on larger uh, space and time scales, this is experimental realization. It's very much sped up, and it's colorized, but this is patches of turbulence in, within a laminar background. Okay, so this is real data from experiments from Bjornhoff's group. Okay, so those are the two things I need you to know about, about uh, subcritical shear flows. Absorbing state transitions, I'm guessing that um, most people know much better than I do. I'll just say this originated in these papers by Janssen and Grasberger, and it applies to a variety of, of systems with absorbing states. Um, I think flu epidemics is a particularly uh, apt thing to, to discuss, but the uh, universality class that I'll be discussing is uh, associated with directed percolation. It's, it's the same thing. Uh, not long after that, Yves Pomeau in the 1980s um, had the realization that subcritical shear flows have the properties of these absorbing state transitions and that one might be able to observe the, the signatures of percolation transitions in these flows. And this was taken up by the Sac Clay community early on 
Now, it turns out it was unappreciated just how large the systems had to be. And so the re they had all the right ideas, but the results were unfortunately unsatisfactory. So let me, again, uh, let me just remind you of a few things. To, that um, in these systems, one has an absorbing state, which for us will be laminar flow. And so that state cannot, that spontaneously become turbulent. That's just meant to, rep meant to represent laminar flow. I told you, all these systems, that laminar flow is stable. If you're in laminar flow, you're never going to leave it spontaneously. All right, then we have the active state, which for us is turbulence. And then with some degree of randomness, it's a deterministic system. Uh, so be careful what I mean by randomness there. Turbulence can re-laminarize, or turbulence can excite nearby laminar flow and increase the turbulent fraction. I am not here going to explain those processes. There, I talked about them yesterday. So there's a lot to say there. I'm just telling you that generically, in an absorbing state transition, one has these ingredients. And these ingredients actually is, exist in turbulent shear flows as well. Okay. So then this is the generic situation. The generic situation, I have an active state, which I think of as turbulence. It'll always show up as black. An absorbing state, which I think of as laminar flow, will always show up as white. I have a control parameter, which generically is a spreading rate versus a decay rate of the active state. What you're going to see here is just generic simulations. Is a coupled map lattice. The on-site dynamics is given by this temp map with an absorbing state here, All right, if that's important to you. So I'm just going to play the simulations. Space, time, one-dimensional. Below some critical value, I don't percolate. Above some critical value, I do. Again, I assume these are well-known ideas here. All right, so we have three important scaling uh, um, uh, parameters to discuss. The first is the, uh, the order parameter, the turbulence fraction. So after you equilibrate, statistically equilibrate, you have the turbulence fraction as a function of the control parameter. If you're below the critical value, that uh, equilibrium fraction is zero, as seen here. You, uh, you don't percolate. Above, uh, above criticality, the equilibrium turbulence fraction goes continu con grows continuously with exponent beta. The other two important um, uh, exponents are due to the uh, spatial and temporal correlations. So I have temporal correlations and spatial correlations. You can, you can measure those. And they diverge as you approach the critical point with exponents uh, new parallel and new perp. Okay? And so those are conjectured to be universal. Um, uh, and if you know those three scaling exponents, you can get any other ones you would care to consider. And those are uh, been observed over and over and over again in many, many models to be uh, uh, universal. The first experimental re realization of directed percolation came only in 2007 um, by these beautiful experiments by uh, Takuchi et al. Um, in a uh, liquid crystal. Um, and so these are, I mean, they're, they're wonderful experiments. They really, they were the first experimental re realization of this process. They, they were able to measure all the exponents with many decades and really confirm that this uh, existed. Um, and not to take anything away from that, but we're coming at this from a, a different point of view. This, these experiments were designed as an experimental re realization of directed percolation because there had been so much written about this and yet no convincing experimental realization. We're coming about it from a completely different point of view. We're trying to understand this classical problem of how do fluids become turbulent. And we're confronted with we have to address percolation because that's the way they become turbulent. Okay? So there, uh, I cut out because I didn't want to go over time. In the past four or five years, there have been a number of papers in which people have been uh, exhibiting uh, evidence, strong evidence, that this is really what takes place in these shear flows. I'll just talk about our work on this for a planar case. We're the first people to do it convincingly in a planar case. So we're looking at what's called wall-left flow. Um, it's a stress-free, it's a, a, a planar shear flow. It's much like plain couet flow, but it's driven by a body force, not by moving walls, and you have stress-free condition. And because of that, you're able to go to large system size, large enough to resolve this. Well, I should just say, let me just go back here. Uh, this work, um, Matt Gentry did all this work. So what you're seeing here now is, again, I told you about these turbulent bands, these turbulent regions. That's what you're seeing here, these turbulent regions. Uh, this is just a snapshot. This blue here is the largest numerical simulation that had been done to date. And this is the largest experimental realization that had been done to date. And if all you want to do is study the flow that you see in this, those are perfectly adequate. The thing is, that's not what you need to study. What you need to do is you need to study something much, much larger. And Matt was able to go to this size. Again, you don't need to go to that size to, to, to study this. But you do need to go to systems 
of this size in order to, to, to see this kind of phenomena, which is what you need to verify the scaling. And let me just say that the thickness of the, the gap of the fluid here is on the size of a pixel on this. You, you know, the, 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 this is incredibly large compared to the fluid gap that you're resolving. So there's turbulence here. This is three-dimensional fluid flow with turbulence, and it's on a, a vast scale, and that's what you need. And so I'm just going to play this movie, and it goes on for a while. What you're seeing is plots of black is turbulence and white is laminar flow. This is turbulent fraction as a function of time. There are two cases being shown. One is very, very, very near critical, and one is substantially above critical. Again, this is a log-log plot. So time is going on linearly here, but being a log-log plot, it's going to get slower and slower and slower. And I may run over here and push the button in just a second. Anyway, what's going to happen, of course, is this is going to equilibrate. It's never going to settle down. Uh, it's going to equilibrate in the sense that the turbulent fraction is going to equilibrate. But you're you know, it's still going to remain turbulent. It's going to be spatial temporal complexity. This is going to uh, continue to decrease. That's the scaling law associated with direct percolation. And you can see this one very near critical is going to follow it for quite some time. And I, at this point, I may come over here and just speed it up a little bit. It goes on and on. So you should think about this as CPU time, millions and millions of hours of CPU time. That's what's being used up just to make this movie. Anyway, there. Oh, that one's still going on. OK, anyway, you know the idea. So then there's a bunch of log log plots. OK, so log log plots. And you verify all the exponents. And you know that's the hard work, but that's uh, you know, not, I, to my point of view, I think we can just skip that. So the, the conclusion is that this is the first evidence that, a pla that these planar shear flows, the way they make the transition to turbulence is actually via a directed percolation uh, phase transition. The transition is actually continuous, which in the community of people who work on um, uh, transition and shear flows, this was a remarkable revelation. They think of these as hard transitions that you either have turbulence or not, and that it's a discontinuous transition. But if you really look at it carefully and precisely, you find there's continuous absorbing state transition. And we really verify the, uh, the exponents of direct percolation. With that, I'll end, and thank you. <laughs>